Welcome to those of you who are new. Um, I hope you have a Bible with you. In this class, in English, we're reading the English Standard Version. Um, of course, you can read whatever version you have, but when we read out loud, that's what we're reading. And in Japanese, I always forget. Okay. So recently we began a new study in here. Um, we've, we've spent the last few years in the New Testament, so we felt we needed to head back into the Old Testament. And this time what we're studying is the Minor Prophets, which are the last 12 books in the Old Testament. <clears throat> and we're taking them in order as we do. The first of the Minor Prophets is Hosea. And we're nearly finished with Hosea tonight. We're in chapter 13. There are only 14 chapters in Hosea. So we're, we're nearly done. When we get done with Hosea, we'll be in Joel, probably a week after next. So I, I won't do a lot of review since we're so close to the end of this study, but a little bit, just for those of you especially who are joining us new. Hosea was a prophet who spoke in the northern kingdom of Israel in the 8th century BC. That happened to be a time of high prosperity, at least in the beginning of his career as a prophet. It was a very prosperous time in, in Israel. By the time he finished his prophetic career, which was really long, maybe 60 years or more, the northern kingdom had nearly been dispersed, having been overrun by the Assyrian Empire. So that's the background for the words that Hosea speaks. When he first began his prophecy, people wouldn't have believed the things that he was saying about the, the coming decline in the northern kingdom because things were going so well and by the time he finished they would have believed it because they would see it happening all around them. <clears throat> Through Hosea, um, as we've seen in this class, God promised final restoration for his people. In the very first chapter of Hosea, he sort of begins with reassuring words that although difficult times are coming, he sees beyond difficult times to a time when, as he says, near the end of chapter 1, Israel in the north and Judah in the south would be reconciled and united under a common head who they would appoint, which I think is a rather messianic vision. I'm not sure if Hosea himself knew quite how the fulfillment would manifest itself, but he did always say in the beginning and in the middle and in the end, always he kept returning to this, this, these words of hope beyond the difficulty that he saw coming into the kingdom. But he definitely saw difficulty coming. Um, basically a complete destruction of the northern kingdom is what he saw. And the reason for it was because of the sin that he saw in the kingdom. And so he spends a lot of time talking about the sin in the kingdom and the punishment that's coming. And as I said, the, the restoration that's coming beyond, beyond all of it. One of the things you'll notice if you read Hosea is it seems like he's repeating himself. And as I have pointed out a few times, the Bible itself only has a few key points that it keeps repeating over and over and over again because God wants us to make sure that we understand what's important by saying it many times in many different ways and by many different voices. And, and that's the same is true for Hosea. In 60 or 70 years, he said a lot of stuff. This is kind of a summary of it. And because he's God's prophet and because God never changes, his message is the same from the beginning to the end. He just says it in different ways. God has described his relationship with Israel as the relationship that exists between a loving father and his disobedient son. Most recently, that's the metaphor God has chosen for himself to describe his relationship with Israel. He's a, he's a father, and Israel is his disobedient son. He began in the first three chapters of this book by describing his relationship as that of a loving husband and Israel being his unfaithful wife. And I think it it helps and it's really necessary to understand what Hosea is all about that we never lose sight of the fact that God perceives himself as having this kind of a loving familial relationship with, with Israel. 
he's at pains to help us understand that while he sees punishment coming to them and, and difficult times coming, it, it gives God no pleasure. He's no less than, than the best human father who wants the best things for, for, his, you know, for their children. God wants the best for his children also. And so um, he, he, he sort of mourns even. He, he shows his heart and he, he says, how can I let these things happen because he loves his child Israel so much. So I've been trying to, every week, to leave people with a question to think about. And here's, here's a big one. If God is a loving father, then why do his children suffer so much? It's not a question that, that I know the perfect answer to or that anybody knows the perfect answer to. Perhaps for 2,000 years people have been thinking about this question. But Surely the prophet Hosea has a lot to say that helps us to think about this very difficult question. We know that God is perfect. We know that God is all-powerful. We know that God is loving. And yet we also look in the world around us and we see suffering everywhere. Um, in the world at large, in God's chosen people, Israel, who the prophet is speaking to, and even among Christians in our time, we see suffering. And so... If you're reading the Bible or if you're living your life and if you're paying any attention at all, you've, you've got to be asking yourself from time to time this question. And other people ask themselves this question and we'll talk about that tonight and I'm sure in the future. So that's as much introduction as I want to do tonight. I'd like to go ahead and, and get into tonight's text, which is Hosea chapter 13. And if you would open up your Bibles and, and sort of follow along with me. Chapter 13 of Hosea begins this way. It says, When Ephraim spoke, there was trembling. He was exalted in Israel, but he incurred guilt through Baal and died. And now they sin more and more and make for themselves metal images, idols skillfully made of their silver, all of them the work of craftsmen. It is said of them, those who offer human sacrifices kiss calves. Those are the first two verses of Hosea chapter 13. So on the slide that I have up, there's a, there's a picture of um, one of the kings in the northern kingdom, maybe uh, Jeroboam, let's say, and offering you know, sacrifices to a golden calf and the people, his subjects, bowing down to it. As you probably, those of you who have been attending the class every week do know, Ephraim was originally, he was the younger son of Joseph, son of Jacob. So remember in, in Joseph's final days when he was, Joseph was a ruler in, in Egypt and as Joseph was dying they brought to him his, his two sons Manasseh and Ephraim and Ephraim was the younger one and, and Manasseh, his older brother, should have been the one that received the blessing but instead Joseph blessed Ephraim ahead of his brother Manasseh, a pattern that you see repeated a lot in the Old Testament. So he was the son of Joseph, that's who he was. He was the head of one of the 12 tribes of Israel, Jacob's sons, and one of the tribes that came to be very powerful over time, one of the most prominent, or the, the most prominent of the tribes in, in Israel. And finally, <clears throat> especially in the prophets, there, there developed the habit of speaking of the 10 tribe northern kingdom of Israel as Ephraim. They used Ephraim's name in place of Israel sometimes, meaning the ten tribe northern kingdom. When the kingdom divided because of Solomon's sin, the northern ten tribes were organized under a king named Jeroboam, Jeroboam the first. And King Jeroboam, not, I, didn't, I don't remember this kind of stuff unless I look it up, King Jeroboam was from the tribe of Ephraim. And so that's part of the reason probably why they refer to, to Ephraim um, you know, a, as a, a description of, of the northern kingdom. And one of the things you'll know about Ephraim, king of Israel, because it says so again and again and again in, in the Old Testament book of Kings, is that he caused Israel to sin. He led people into sin in the northern kingdom here. So that helps you understand then, back to Hosea chapter 13, verse 1, when Ephraim spoke, there was trembling, he was exalted in Israel. This could refer to king... Jeroboam, it could refer to, 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 to Ephraim, and he says, but he incurred guilt through Baal, and he died. And not just he died, but all the people that he led into sin, you know, followed after him. 
died, and it says, now they sin more and more and make for themselves metal images. This is something we've seen a lot so far in 12 chapters of Hosea. The, the, the central sin probably of the northern kingdom is that they turn aside after other gods that they make images uh, of and, 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 and worship. And here the thought is, they don't just sort of make crude images, they make skillful images. They're using the, the gifts that God gave them, the precious metals, the, the skills that they have as craftsmen. They're devoting themselves to making these images, works of craftsmanship. Some translations say works of their own wisdom, um, which are the things that they prefer to worship rather than the, the living God. And then it ends by saying something peculiar. The English Standard Version has it this way. It says, it is said of them, those who offer human sacrifice, kiss calves. It's possible um, that, that um, here they're actually referring to, to, to human sacrifice. There was a habit in that region of people sacrificing their children to Molech. And, and some of that probably happened in the, in the northern kingdom. I don't know if there's a sense, Mark, do you know if, if there was a, if human sacrifice was, was all that common in the northern kingdom. And in fact, some of the translators don't translate it this way. They say, of, of those humans who sacrificed, referring not to, to the fact that they sacrificed humans, but there were humans who did sacrifice, that the way that they sacrificed was by kissing the, the calves. In either case, I think we, we understand now after 12 chapters of Hosea that what we're looking at is a, is a picture in northern Israel uh, the, of people who have turned aside from God and who are worshiping false gods. One of the things I, I thought as I was preparing these, I just wanted to step aside and say this because the thought occurred to me, is if you consider Ephraim, the, 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 the northern kingdom of Israel, and all of the depravity that the prophet sees there and that we know existed there, and all of the bad things that they did and the disloyal things that they did, or if you can consider humanity in general and all the wickedness that there is in humanity, the fact that such depravity is possible is kind of proof that God is gracious and long-suffering. If it weren't for the Holy Spirit sort of hovering over the face of the earth and superintending us, we probably would have all eaten each other and there wouldn't be any humans left alive. I mean, the fact that there is a human population is proof that, that God has not forsaken his handiwork. Or as I've mentioned recently in, in Genesis chapter 6, it says that God surveyed the world and he saw that there was nothing but wickedness in the hearts of men all the time. And he was sorry that he had made men and he was thinking to wipe out everyone with a flood, but Noah found favor with God. And so we know, because God has told us in several different ways, perhaps especially in the, in the case of Noah, that he's thoroughly unhappy with the sin that he finds in humanity. And we can see it ourselves, how much sin there is in humanity. And if we look inside of ourselves, we can be really sure that we know how much sin that there is in humanity, and yet the fact that we even exist is proof that God is gracious. We don't always understand what God is doing, but he's amazingly long-suffering and amazingly gracious, and as he himself has said through the prophet Hosea, he's our father who loves us and aims to, to, to make things come good. And the picture that I put up is just a picture of a rainbow, which is the symbol that God gave us of this. He said, you know, whenever you look in the sky, you can remember that I promised you, Noah and all the rest of us, that I'm not going to do what in some ways I should do, which is wipe all of you out and start over again. In fact, he has a different idea about how he's going to redeem his people. It just occurred to me that all the wickedness is a strange kind of proof of God's goodness because God can tolerate it and work to redeem it in some other way. All right, so we continue reading, and in the, to the, the verse 3 of Hosea, he says, therefore, he is referring back to all of the idolatry that's referred to in the previous verse, therefore they, and he must mean Ephraim, therefore they shall be like the morning mist, or like the dew that goes early away, or like the chaff that swirls from the threshing floor, or like smoke from a window. He's used four figures of speech here to describe what they are 
Ephraim is like. They are like something which is, it exists, smoke exists, mist exists, dew exists, chaff exists, but it can be dispersed and, and made to seem almost as if it didn't exist because it's, it's dispersed to the point where you can't see it anymore. The picture I have up is just a, a picture of a, some farm country with the mist in the early morning and you know when the sun comes up pretty soon if we took this picture an hour later there wouldn't be any mist left because the sun would be up and it would all be gone away someplace out of sight. And I think God is through, through Hosea is saying that's what the northern kingdom is going to be like. Uh, you know, it's, it's wicked as he's described in the first two verses and he's saying therefore they're going to go away. They're, they're going to disappear like, like the morning, morning mist. And we know, in fact, that's what does happen to the ten tribes in the north. They're dispersed into the nations, never to this day to be reconstituted as, an, as a nation again. Okay, so they, they shall be like the morning mist or like the dew that goes early away, like the chaff that swirls from the threshing floor, like the smoke from a window. And he's not talking, I think, about the individual people in the nation, but about the nation as a whole, which he's been referring to for some time as his son, Jacob, the nation in, in total. So then in verse 4, he says, But I am the Lord your God. From the land of Egypt you know no God but me, and besides me there is no Savior. So human beings, the people in the north in particular who the pro prophet is speaking to, they're like mist that passes away. That's the way human beings, beings are. The, the wickedness will just be dispersed by God. But it says here, not God. God is different. God is always there. I am the Lord your God. Here. It, it, we're, we're supposed to understand Yahweh, right? The, the God who identified himself to Moses in the burning bush and described himself as the, the Lord their God. And he says here about himself, I am the Lord your God, how he describes himself, the one that brought you out of Egypt. Earlier, remember last week or the week before, God described himself as their father and, and their birth is coming out of Egypt. He's, he's that God. He's the only God. You know no God but me. He's their God. I am the Lord, your God. And he says, I am the only Savior. Right? So that's what God is compared to what they are. They're like mist that, that flies away. He is Yahweh. You know, the great I am. He is their God who brought them out of Egypt. He is the only God, as we know, that there is. And if there's any hope for them or any of us, it's this God because he is the only Savior that, that there is. And the picture I have up on, this, on the screen is just a picture of Moses encountering this God in the burning bush where he identified himself by this name. Uh, I am who I am, Yahweh. So Israel should easily have remembered the true God because of the history of their nation remembers him so graphically and they, and they have the written history of their nation as, as well. And yet they forgot him. And why did, why did they forget him? Is because they became prosperous and successful and that caused them to forget. As he'll go on to say in the next verse. So verses 5 and 6. All right, so in 5 and 6, he says, It was I who knew you in the wilderness, in the land of drought. But when they grazed, they became full. They were filled, and their heart was lifted up. Therefore, they forgot me. That's verses 5 and 6. And this is a... One of the things that Hosea has said over and over again in, in different words and in different ways. Jacob was born in obscurity. He had to go off to hide out from his brother Esau, who, whom he had cheated, worked for years tending livestock before he could get his wife and come home again. And then his children 
were sent into Egypt to save them from the famine that was in the land, where Joseph ruled for a time. Then they were in slavery, and God came and brought them out of there. God was with them in the wilderness himself, delivering them finally safely to the promised land and doing all of the other things to bless them, finally giving them kings, including the Davidic kingdom, which is to last forever. Right. All these things God has, has done for them, and the result of God's graciousness, despite their wickedness, is, as he's already said, they, they continue to go after the Baals more and more, and they forget who God is. And the reason why is because God has blessed them so much. Right. When they were poor, it was easier for them to see God. Now they're rich. I have up here a picture of the tabernacle and the wandering in the wilderness, and then of Solomon's temple in all its, its glory. As God blessed them, they went farther away from him. That's what God is saying through the, the, the prophet here. And this is one of the many lessons in Hosea that we have to take to heart for ourselves, right? Because it's, it's true of all people, not just the people in northern Israel. You know, often God has to, to take us to a hard place so that we can see him, and he's with us there, and we have him, although maybe not a lot else. Then he blesses us and prospers us, and the next thing you know, we think we did it, right? We, we, think, we think we're successful because we're smarter, we're hardworking, or whatever it is we think. Last week he said the people even thought that they were spiritually pure. They thought there was no iniquity in them because they misunderstood. They thought their blessing was a sign that God was happy with them, and when in fact nothing could be further from the, the truth. And so we have to watch ourselves also, you know, and, and if we happen to be blessed, then that's the time to be frugal and moderate and, and careful that you're not, you know, we're not corrupted by our success because that's what people tend to do. And that's what the people in the north did. They were much more powerful than the people in the south, the, the tribe of Judah. They were proud of the fortifications. They were proud of their horses. They were proud of their soldiers. They were proud of their wealth. They were proud of their worship. They were proud of themselves, so they forgot God. And that's the situation that we keep seeing through Hosea again and again in the north. And so, again, and this is the fourth time, that, if I'm counting right, that God has described himself as a, as a lion, although now he, he's going to be also a bear and a leopard as well. I resisted the temptation to put up a picture of, the, of uh, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. That, that, that probably would have been bad. Right. So in verses 7 and 8, God says through the prophet, so, so I am to them like a lion. So why so? Because they've forgotten him. If they would remember him, he's nothing like a lion that tears or like a leopard that tears or like a bear that attacks. He's their loving father. He's their loyal husband. All they need to do is cling to him like Jacob did. But if they turn away from him, which is the most dangerous thing they can do for themselves, then God will seem to them different. So, he says, I am to them like a lion, like a leopard I will lurk beside the way. I will fall upon them like a bear robbed of her cubs. I will tear open their breast, and there I will devour them like a lion, as a wild beast would rip them open. Okay, that's verses 7 and 8. So here's something we, we should slow down and, and, and think about. God has described himself as a loving father, as a loving husband. God is, we know, perfectly good all the time, unchanging in that way. And yet he says that he will be to his people like a bear, like a leopard, like a lion. And so the only way we can understand this is that he will be that way to them for their benefit, because the only thing he cares about is their benefit. They're his children. So John Calvin says when, whenever God has to put on this, another character like this, since God is himself by, by nature loving, God is love, when he has to put on a fearsome aspect, it's, it's like he's putting on a character for our, for our benefit. It would always be a mistake 
to think that God needed to terrify us or that it would do him any good. Or that God himself in, enjoys punishing people or seeing people suffer. It's God's objective to redeem people. And the people that he's dealing with are described by the prophet in northern Israel as just almost completely unredeemable. He's done everything for them and it just makes them turn away from him and forget him. And so now they're coming up to the period in history where, as we've discussed several times before, the most loving thing that God can do for them is to let them go. Okay, is to let them let them suffer. Before when he described himself as a lion, he says, I tear so that I can heal. So, so God is sometimes scary, and when God is scary, that's a different aspect of his love. I find that in my life, I've said this before, do you guys ha have this kind of experience? Yeah, I, I've, I've, I've often thought God's love is extremely painful because sometimes he really needs to get my attention. Okay, so verse 9 says in the English Standard Version, He destroys you, O Israel, for you are against me, against your helper. This is a difficult passage for the translators to handle. There are many different ways to handle this one. And I can't be sure which one is, is correct. Almost all of the ones that I've looked at read this to, dis to suggest a kind of self-destruction. Israel is destroying itself. God is not destroying them. They're destroying themselves by rejecting God. God is perfectly good. God is their father. God wants only the best for them. And yet their sin comes between them and God. And so they are destroying themselves in, in that way. So the only way I can understand this, and I, I could be, be wrong, is that, that, that God, God gives us enough freedom that we can destroy ourselves, although he's very reluctant to see us succeed in our attempts to destroy ourse ourselves. He's made us in, in such a way that we can actually rebel against him, who's all-powerful. And to the extent we're successful in rebelling against God, we're dead because he's the only place where there's life and where there's salvation. But, but God is very reluctant to ever see that happen, and so God's grace is super abundant. He's always doing amazing things that we can see and probably amazing things we can't see because he has an idea to redeem a people for himself beyond our wickedness, despite our, our wickedness. So he destroys you, Israel, for you are against me, against your helper. God is our helper. He's our only savior, he said before. He's the only God, he said before. Reject him and there's no place that you can go for salvation. Blessing them with material prosperity hasn't helped them. It's only caused them to turn away from him. So now the, what he's going to do is something different. He's going to let them suffer in hopes that they can be saved in a different way. Okay, so then he, he goes on, Hosea does, in, in verses 10 through 12. And he says, Where now is your king to save you in all your cities? Where are all your rulers, those of whom you said, Give me a king and princes? I gave you a king in my anger, and I took him away in my wrath. What an interesting thing for, for God to, to say. Those of you who, who read your Old Testament a lot probably will think right away, well maybe 
the prophet is thinking about Samuel and King Saul, right? Remember the people in Israel looked around and they said, we don't have a king, but the nations round about have a king. Give us a king. And they went to the prophet Samuel and said, give us a king. And Samuel was insulted and God said, they're, they're not dissatisfied with you, they're dissatisfied with me that they want a human king instead of the living God. But I think that that's probably not what the prophet Hosea is thinking of here. I think here <coughs> he's thinking about the northern kingdom where he's a prophet. And the northern kingdom insisted on rebelling against the house of David, if, you, if you'll recall. They wanted a king other than someone from the house of David, and so God let them have one. In fact, God even anointed that king, Jeroboam I. That's when the ten-tribe northern kingdom was born. And I've, as I've said often enough in this class, the ten-tribe northern kingdom could never do anything but fail. It's, it's by definition in rebellion against the house of David and the promise that God made to the people of Israel. It was just a question of when and how God was going to do away with the northern kingdom. It always, it always had to happen. But the, the way that it has happened, as we've seen through, through the prophet and, and other things we can read in the Bible, is that God gave them a king. They prospered in a military and in an economic way. They developed a whole religious apparatus which wasn't very pleasing to God. They ignored the words of the prophets that, that spoke to them, trying to call them back. And they ignored God, and they tried to make alliances with people around about it. And so in the end, their, their punishment will be that the kingdom will be taken away from them. But the punishment's always been there from the beginning. When God gave them the king in the first place, they were already in rebellion against God, right? So I think that's the sense here where he says, I gave you a king in my anger, and I took him away in my wrath. This was something that's been long, long prepared by, by God. Okay. In verse 12, he says, The iniquity of Ephraim is bound up, his sin is kept in store. So from, from the very beginning, when they rebelled against the house of David and against God and against the temple, and God gave them a king just like they wanted, it was in, already in the mind of God that, 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 that the sin was there, and the sin is still there. Two or three hundred years later, I guess it would be by now. And so now the sin is going to be, going to be punished. They're coming up to the time when that initial rebellion against God and his king are going to result in the destruction of the, the, the northern kingdom. <clears throat> Verse 13, he says, The pangs of childbirth come for him, but he is an unwise son, for at the right time, he does not present himself at the opening of the womb. Interesting metaphor this, don't you think so? I wonder if God me means to describe himself as this pregnant woman here. I'm sure there's some female theologians who think so. Um, it, it, it might be. So, so God, is, God is saying that that they have an opportunity, they've always had an opportunity to turn back to him. The prophet's calling them back, their circumstances are calling them back, they're in trouble, all they have to do is turn back to God and be saved. And that, that's not to be what, what will happen with the nation. God's child Ephraim is not going to be born because it's, he's not going to take advantage of the opportunity that God's given them. Okay. And so, I mean, what happens if a baby is not born when the time comes? So in some sense, it, it'll, it'll die, right? I mean, this, this the, 
the nation clearly is, is, is going to die. This is, this is not a, a happy circumstance for, for them. <clears throat> all right, and so, um, as he's been describing them all along, they're a foolish child, they're a foolish son. God loves them, but they won't do what's best for themselves, and they're not, they're not taking advantage of, of this opportunity. And so, in some sense, they're going to they're gonna die as a nation. <clears throat> So in verse 14, the prophet says, Shall I ransom them from the power of Sheol? Shall I redeem them from death? O death, where are your plagues? O Sheol, where is your sting? Compassion is hidden from my eyes. So the thing I think we're going to, going to have to do, because a lot of you will recognize these words from the Apostle Paul. Let's look back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is where Paul is talking about resurrection and eternal life. That's a really long chapter, isn't it? <laughs> so, let me start in, in verse 54. So, P Paul is talking about resurrection and eternal life. And in verse 54, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 54, I'll start reading. It says, When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, and he's quoting from the prophet Hosea, death is swallowed up in victory, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? And so on. So this is a, a very well-known and important passage in, in the New Testament, which almost certainly is a reflection by the Apostle Paul on what Hosea had said 800 and some years earlier. So the question arises whether Hosea is saying the same thing Paul is or not. So let's go back to Hosea again. Yeah, you said do moi maska. What do you think? Do you think do you think Hosea is saying the same thing Paul is or not? Mark, what do you think? It's kind of a hard question, actually. I can say that in the last 2,000 years, a lot of people have made a lot of sermons and written a lot of pages where they try to make a connection. And it's not a it's not a fair question because you haven't had a lot of time to think of it. I, I would say that the Apostle Paul is reflecting on a bit of ancient prophecy in a very interesting way. Yeah. Yeah, and it really does seem that way if you're reading the English Standard Version. Anybody have a King James Version? Or some other translation in the King James? Or? Because this is another passage that the translators really struggle with. <clears throat> 
Some of the translators read verse 14 this way. They'll say, I shall ransom them from the power of Sheol. I shall redeem them from death. The best translators basically say there's no way you can get a question here, which means I guess we're going to have to say that the ESV might be, wrong, might be not the best translation now, but I'm not, I don't have the, the skills to say that. But I, I do have the skills to say that if you look at six or seven different translations, what you'll see is then in, in many of them, instead of a question at the beginning of verse 14, you have two statements that are, I ransom them from the power of Sheol, I shall, I shall redeem them from death. Then, O oh death, where, is, where are your plagues? O oh Sheol, where is your sting? And the other thing that, the, that you'll see a lot, a, a lot of difference in in the, in the different translations is ESV says, compassion is hidden from my eyes. But a lot of translations are more to the effect that God will not change his mind. So some, some of the translations are, are basically saying that he will re ransom, he will redeem, and he's not going to change his mind. And Paul would have quoted from this passage, not upside down, right, Mark? I mean, Paul would have gone, gone to this passage because it was an example he found in the prophets of God's power to redeem from death. So when Paul read this passage, he, he evidently didn't read it upside down. Would you agree? He, 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 was, he was probably not citing it as proof of his argument, but he was, he was reading it as evidence that God can redeem beyond death. Yeah. In the King James, it's really different than the ESV. Just read it. Yeah, I, I know. I, I don't have a King James with me. In the King James, it says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hidden from my eyes. And when he says, repentance shall be hidden from my eyes, the meaning is, he's not going to change his mind. Right? And so, the King James Version, also NASB, also New King James, and some other translations read that way. And so you, you'll read this passage is basically promised by God that he's going to redeem these people, which is consistent with what the prophet has been saying since chapter 1, right? Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, a couple times in between, he ends with, on a hopeful note. And so God through the prophet has always been saying enough that we're going to have to not ignore this point is he's going to redeem them somehow, right? The repetition alone make, hammers that down. Now, the, the difference of opinion on verse 14, I can let just hang there. Um, but I personally think that a better translation is, in this particular case, is closer to what the King James says, because I don't think the questions here are probably right. But even if you read them as questions, you could read it as hopeful, right? So God has, has seen all of the bad things that they do and they won't present themselves at the womb even though it's time for them to be born. And he doesn't say, therefore, there's no hope for them. He says, shall I ransom them? Shall I redeem them? And Sheol and death are just a, a, a poetic parallelism. It's not like two different things. He's just like, like Hebrew literature often does. It's, he's just saying it two different ways to, to make the same point. So he could be saying, compassion is hidden from my eyes for a moment, but ultimately I'm going to redeem, which seems to be what the prophet has been saying again and again and again. So, sorry, this is going to be really hard for everybody to understand what we're talking about. To, to pick up, to collect the points, verse, four, verse 14 is an important quotation people will, most people will know from the New Testament because the Apostle Paul says this in chapter 15, which is probably the most important chapter of 1 Corinthians. Some people think Paul wrote all of 1 Corinthians just to decorate chapter 15, which is talking of Karl Barth did, which, which is to think of resurrection and death. Paul went back to the Old Testament because he saw in the, in the prophet Hosea proof of what he was talking about or at least a consistency between what he was talking about. And what Paul was talking about is the fact that God is powerful enough to redeem things even after death. 
And he sees Hosea saying something along those lines that God is powerful enough to redeem anything. And so I think the Apostle Paul is making a, a great reflection on the Old Testament. And I do think the, sim the similarity between what Hosea said and what Paul said is, is there, as I've already said, because God can redeem beyond death. But my question was, do you think Paul is, and Hosea are saying the same thing? And I think the answer is, well, no, not exactly. I, I don't think Hosea, from his perspective, looking forward, could be saying the same things that Paul was saying. Because like Mark said, Paul is saying the things that he's saying from the other side of the cross. The Apostle Paul the Pharisee, before Jesus knocked him down in a blinding flash of light on the road to Emmaus, wouldn't have read it that way, right? I mean, he's, he, he sees it that way now because he's Christian, because, he, because, because the Holy Spirit lets him see it that way. But Hosea is only talking about the northern kingdom. His prophecy is about what's happening to the northern kingdom. And what he's saying is it's corrupt, it's turned away from God, it's going to be punished. Now certainly it will be punished. And it would seem like that there's no hope, and yet Hosea finds hope. And Hosea keeps finding, finding hope that death, and now he's talking about the death of a nation, not the, that probably not like Paul is, the death of individual souls, that God has some plan, some mysterious plan to redeem the northern kingdom. That's what the spirit that was in the prophet you know, knew. And it may well be that the fulfillment is exactly what Paul is talking about, but I, I think it's hard to, to know that Hosea would have had those concepts in his, his mind in the 8th century before Jesus was born. And you see that a lot. You know, when the apostles look back in the Old Testament, they're taking the light of Christ with them. And so what they're finding there is, not, is, is a much um, more perfect version of what the Old Testament prophet could have, could have seen, you know, probably. All right, so anyhow, verse 14 is a, is a tough one, and, and I, I think it's, it's just repeating the theme that we've seen repeated now many times before by Hosea, that there is redemption for the northern kingdom, even if it's hard to think about how that's going to happen. It's going to happen. Hosea speaks the words of God to that effect. All right. All right. I guess I had slides saying all the stuff I just said. But anyway, um, so Hosea is speaking of the future of the nation of Israel beyond its coming death as a nation. God has the power to ransom and redeem them. Will he? Jose has been saying that, that they, he will. He said it several times before now. But in verse 14, whether this is confirmation of that point or not is a matter of dispute among translators because it's, it's a hard passage to translate for people. And I say this often enough, but for those of you who aren't here that all that often, if you read something in the Bible and it's not clear to you, don't worry. <laughs> there are passages like this that the best minds in Christendom haven't understood for 2,000 years. You know, I mean, there's, there's hard bits in the Bible that, that, that there's no easy way to read, and this is one of them. Okay, so what is certain is that the kingdom is going to fall. This is the same picture I had up at the end of last week, at the end of chapter 12, where God said that he's going to lead them back out into something like the, the Feast of Tabernacles, remember? They're, they're all set up in the kingdom. He's led them through the wilderness. They've occupied the promised land. They've become prosperous. They're there. They've turned away from God. It's not working for them. And so God says he's going to, he's going to take them out of there. He's going to bring that kingdom down and take them back to a, a place that's somehow like where they were wandering in the wilderness when they lived with him in tents. He's going to take them to a, a different kind of a, kind of a place. And here in chapter 13, you get the same sort of ending. He says, though he may flourish among his brothers, he's talking about Ephraim, though he may flourish among his brothers, the east wind, the wind of the Lord, shall come rising from the wilderness, and his fountain shall dry up, and his springs shall be parched, 
It shall strip his treasury of every precious thing. Samaria shall bear her guilt because she has rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword. Their little ones shall be dashed in pieces and their pregnant women ripped open. A very graphic image here that has been before our eyes for a while now. It seemed increasingly inevitable and now I would say it's completely inevitable in the words of the, of the prophet that the northern kingdom is going to, going to fall. But despite that fact, there's this mysterious hope that, that the prophet has that it's going to be redeemed. Okay. And that too, you know, has its personal application because it seems to us like death is the end, but we know that it's not because God has the power to redeem beyond death. It seemed to the people in the north like their kingdom would have been completely obliterated and yet strangely it's not because God has the power to redeem beyond death. How does that work? Only God knows for sure, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 you can read what the Apostle Paul thought and that, that will repay your time. Okay. All right, so... Um, I guess that's it tonight, where I finished a little bit earlier than normal. Did anybody have anything that struck you as we were going along that was really hard to understand or you, some insight you had that the rest of us could benefit from? what we asked for but then he still wasn't pleased with how we were yeah an interesting thought or or you could say sometimes the worst thing that could happen to us is that God gives us what we ask for right? so people we all of us aren't great at prayer but we spend a lot of time asking God for things that we should be very thankful God doesn't give to us God knows what we need they were asking here for a king and that was not what they needed but God in his larger purpose decided to answer that prayer and give them what they wanted and it, it, it didn't work the way they thought it would and that's a really good one By the way, I'm guilty. <laughs> I'm guilty of it too. I'm guilty of everything, but what are you guilty of? <laughs> of, of bad prayers, you mean? <laughs> yeah, asking for stupid things. This is nothing new, Greg, but I appreciate the point that when Paul is quoting the same scripture that we're having a challenge with, that it is worth remembering that he was, as you said, seeing it from the other side of the cross. And that is a big help very often in understanding why the New Testament writers understood things in a very different way. Yeah, I mean, the, the New Testament quotes from the prophet Hosea, now we've seen probably a half a dozen you know, citations, and when the, when the apostles, or even Jesus, you know, quoted from Hosea twice or three times, I think, so far that we've noticed, uh, 
there, the connection is always there, but you could make the mistake of, of thinking that, that the New Testament reflection is precisely the same point that the Old Testament prophet was making, which is often not the case. Right? And, and I think people misread their Old Testament sometimes that way. Um, because we do have light that they didn't, they didn't have. Um, so. It's often said God reveals himself progressively, you know, and so they had the light that they had. But that was like the sun was barely coming up, right? We have the light of the, of the noonday sun because Christ has already risen, and so we can see everything so much more clearly than even a prophet could have seen in the Old Testament. That's our great advantage, you know, to, to read the, the Old Testament as, as Christians. Anything else? I guess. Yeah. Uh, I have a question regarding that statement. In, in the Gospels, where you find a statement saying that um, this happened to fulfill the prophecy of so and so. If you find that such kind of statement, does, not, that, does that not mean that the statement in the Old Testament is directly linked to that statement which is in the Gospel? They are saying. It happened to Jesus to fulfill the prophecy by Isaiah or by other people. Well, the answer has to be yes, right? <laughs> um, but, but, but perhaps not in, but, but perhaps precisely in the way that the New Testament, particularly Christ, I mean, if, if Christ says this happened to fulfill what, what the prophet said, the only thing I could say is yes, the Son of God is right about that. <laughs> But my point is, is different. I'm saying that, that the fulfillment that, that Jesus saw, that Paul saw in the light of the gospel, would not necessarily be what the Old Testament prophet saw. Right? So what, I, you know, I, I really think that some people naively read the Old Testament as if, you know, Jesus had already done his work on the cross before the Old Testament was written, and, and, and he didn't, right? It, it came later. So they're foreshadowings, but, but, but um, you know. Isn't that right? I mean, am I wrong about that? It's okay, any, any, other, any other thing? <clears throat> okay, well, let's pray, then you guys can escape. And dear God, I do hope that we've understood tonight rightly the things that were written uh, in Hosea chapter 13. I pray as always, Lord, that if we have uh, mishandled your word in any way or misunderstood any part of it, that you would cause us quickly to forget uh, any kind of error like that. But the parts that we've understood correctly, Lord, please uh, burn those into our memories and, and into our hearts. Um, please cause that understanding to grow and deepen in us in the years ahead. Please bless these people for having come here on a weekday evening when they were tired uh, to study your word and please help them to get home safely tonight without any incident. Please also have your eye on people who ordinarily come here but couldn't be with us tonight because they were stuck at work or they were sick or for whatever reason detained them. We know that you're watching them as well. Please let those people know that we're thinking of them and that we love them and bring them back again as, as soon as is good. Um, we ask your blessing on this church, all the people who worship here, the pastors who pastor here, all the people who do ministry here, but we say the very same things for every church in this world that gathers in the name of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. <laughs>